Okay, now many of you guys have been sitting here um, learning a lot of information, but I think what, what's on everybody's mind is when you go back to the office and log in at your computer and you're not a member of the board, what are you going to do today? Well, Bernie, Drake, and Judge Parker are going to clear the muddied waters about how we can handle that situation and what's going on with this, the GAR contracts being for realtors only and how each of us can use non-GAR contracts free. So free is a good word, but they'll, they're going to help get us through this process. Thanks, Mary. And I'm not going to do most of the talking because Judge is an instructor and he, this is something he's passionate about. But I do want to say a few words to everybody because the, as you know, with Drake, we have all these companies and we have all these companies for various reasons. And we do have a company that is a board member company and that's Drake Realty of Greater Atlanta. So anybody in there, this doesn't apply to you. You already are paying for forms through your annual membership. Then we have Drake Realty and Drake Realty of Georgia, which are not board members. And the only reason I did want to mention this to you guys, that we never, Drake Realty when it started was never a member of the board. And we never joined the board, we never have. And the only reason was because of their policy that if the broker joins, every agent has to. And our business philosophy has always been to offer agents a choice when it comes to spending your money, as long as we can do that. That's one reason why we have all these companies. But that is that is our passion and that's how we started the company. That was one of our basic business philosophies. So. We did open Drake Realty of Greater Atlanta after Drake Realty, just so that anybody who would like to be a part of the board could. And keeping the Drake Realty name, it doesn't impact your business if you decide in the middle of the year, I need to be in the board. It's, your clients aren't gonna go, oh, you're with this company now? So the company name's consistent. And there's a reason, and that's the reason. We wanted consistency for our agents so that you have the flexibility you can move among our plans, you can move among our companies. But I did want to let you know that that basic business philosophy is something that we have adhered to since we opened, is because we do want to offer you a choice when it comes to your money. That's why when we found out in the, this fall that the GAR was going to make this change, we got together with some of the other brokers um, who are not members of the Board of Realtors, and we all got together and started talking about well, what are we going to do? because. You know, that's, it wasn't a $25 fee, it's a $200 fee. It's significant. And that's why we felt like we had to come up with something because it does state on the bottom of the form who, it, who the license belongs to. And they are asking the members to help them make sure that the forms are being properly used. So it's not gonna, it's not to anybody's benefit to think you got one up on them. And, you went in with a group of people and you all bought a license or something, it's just not going to help anybody. So, I, you know, because it could come back to haunt you and it could come back to haunt you big time and that's what we don't want to happen. So that's why all of us had gotten together. We were prepared to fund the new forms that FMLS and Georgia MLS actually are funding and putting out there. We actually had told them we would put the money behind it and help develop these forms because we do think that there needs to be an alternative. So. That's just kind of the history of what's happened. Now, since I've never been a member of the board, Judge Parker, who has done CE classes for us in the past, and he's a great guy, very knowledgeable, he's going to take over here and kind of go through some of the stuff because, trust me, he can explain it so much better than I can, and he does it all the time. So, and then at the end, questions will be, you guys ask any questions you want to ask, but I did want to kind of give you an idea of what, why there's even this discrepancy and that's part of is that basic rule the broker belongs that everybody has to belong to the board and it's not an option for our agents so anyway here's judge parker thank you well bernie and i had a conversation last week in reference to all of these changes in rough about the gar farms let me give you some history as to what has got us to this point um, I sat on the executive committee for GAR for about four years, about six years actually, and we had this conversation back in 2006 and early 2004 when they released the forms to MLS and FMLS for their members. And they did this 
in order to create a uniformity in the marketplace. Now, I've sat on GAR's executive committee as well as their forums committee for, for about 10 years. And at that time, I specifically stated that when you decide to make a change, it is going to be catastrophic and somewhat def detrimental to the industry. Well, we own the forms, we can make the change if we feel the need to in the future. Fine, I understand that. However, if you make the change, it could be catastrophic and detrimental to the industry. The whole intent for them releasing the forms to everyone in the beginning was to create uniformity in the marketplace. So therefore, the forms were used widely by every agent. Every agent from J to Savannah to the Golden Isles used used the GAR forms by virtue of MLS or FMLS or some other multiple listing ent entity that may have been in the area. So GAR decided that because, and, and let's be honest folks, it's about money and membership. Yes, yes, yes. It's about money and membership. And you know what, if someone tells them I said that, I don't care because that's what it's about. And we have to be realistic. GAR from 2005 to this point has lost almost 60% of its membership. They're down to 23,000 where they were up as much as 48,000. So now you have to make a decision as to how I'm going to get you, who's sitting in these chairs, who are not guard members, to get you to come back. Well, what's the easiest way to do it? Pull something that you are actually using on a daily basis where you have no thought about. You just go and get it and keep on moving. So I'm going to take that basic form away from you and now you're going to have to go out and decide how I'm going to now do business with my clients and customers with a document that's going to not only protect you but protect your clients and customers interests. So they decided that we're going to pull it and if you're going to be a member of it, we're going to provide benefit to our membership. That's well and good. However, you were told or mentioned in the beginning that if you do this, it's going to create a problem which leads us to where we are today. As effective today at, well, midnight last night, 12.01, uh, the forms are now available only to individuals with a NERJ number. And those of you who had probably were a member at some point in time got one of these cards that gave you your NERJ number. And it's a simple number that identifies you as a member of the National Association of Realtors. So you ask the question, just, well, why are you still a member? Well, I'm a member now to get involved, to help facilitate some changes, even if I disagree with what they're doing, by leaving it leaves them the option to continue to do the things that I disagree with and they don't have a voice to say what your disagreement is about. That's why I'm still a member. That's why I continue to do what I do in order for them to understand that not everything that you do is agreeable by all the people that you quote unquote serve. So therefore, someone needs to tell them when it's a difference here and you need to reconsider your thoughts. And I think that they are reconsidering it right now. However, they're probably not going to make a change. But there is some reconsideration there because of the fact that of the impact it's going to have on our industry. We're going to start seeing forms all over the place. It's going to be many different types of forms that you're going to see. Let's be honest. FMLS and MLS got together to create a form. That was great. When I first heard about it, I talked with several attorneys that I was going to fund put some money out to create forms. But when I heard that they were doing it, I said, okay, let's see what's going to happen. Now, how do you use the GAR forms if you're not a member? Can I use the GAR forms if I'm not a member? Yes, you can. However, it has to be involved with an agent who is a GAR member or have licensing authorization to use that form. Down on the bottom of those forms, it auto-populates an individual's name. My form that you see with, with that I may use for my clients or customers is going to have Judge Parker's name down on the bottom. And there's a disclaimer down there that states that this person is licensed to use this form by virtue of an agreement with the Georgia Association of Realtors. And if the person affiliated in the, the person's name listed here must be affiliated in the transaction in order for this form to be enforceable, something to that effect. And if it's not, if you white it out, Put your name there and you don't have the license that renders that form in unenforceable and you violated a copyright issue or a licensing issue. So therefore you may be affected by GAR with that. Now, as a GAR member, anytime the forms are challenged in court, that, that Seth Wiseman, Wiseman, Noah, Curry, Wilco will 
um, be your legal counsel in order to help you with that challenge of that form. Not necessarily the challenge of what you might have done or might not have done, but the validity of the content in that form, they will support that by being a guard member. Now, if you buy the licensing, everybody know how to get the licensing uh, if you wanted to just use the forms and pay for the licensing on a on a yearly basis. Anybody know how to do that? Nope. Nope. There's several software vendors. Go to GAR or excuse me, GARealtor.org. That's their website where it says legal law and ethics tab. Click on the law and ethics tab and it will bring up all of the software vendors that are available. It's $199 um, per calendar year. So if you buy it in November, you only got to pay for it from November to December, and then January you got to pay for it again. It's not a 12 month period, it's per calendar year. So you can be able to access them. And then once you have authorization, your name will auto populate in there because you will have a password that's only significant to who you are, and therefore it will auto populate. Now, if you're using the, um, what is it, Transaction Desk and FMLS system now, First Connect or fusion system if you when you go and click on the use of that particular document it's going to ask you for a nerds number and you'll have to put in whatever that authorization code is that you have uh, in order to access it now can you use it through your software vendors can you use it through the transaction desk after you buy it from a software vendor right now I'm gonna say no because I haven't fixed that problem yet you'll have to go to that software vendors website to get it They've been working on trying to make that happen, but it's about four or five different software vendors that are available that GAR has have approved that will allow, be allowed to distribute the, um, the forms. So it's, it's still ongoing changes that are going to be, you're going to see a few more changes here in the next few days uh, regarding access and some of the forms. There are going to be some, some minor tweaking of the forms as well because there are some items uh, that some case law have come about that they're going to have to make the necessary adjustments uh, regarding. But just understand that it is a it is a issue that only not only you all are, that are not guard members are somewhat um, upset about. It is some of the guard members have had and some some guard members who were on some committees were asked to leave because of the fact that they disagree with it as well. So it, it's not just you all who are not members who are upset, it's a, it's a lot of individuals that have a lot of problems with how it came about. Now this has been a three and a half year study of this for them to determine how they were going to do it. They had a little uh, ad hoc committee to investigate it and this was their recommendation and the executive body on last year uh, at the um, convention approved it and therefore it was going to be enforced. Uh, beginning of this year and they put all of the elements together in order to make that happen this year but it is something that we're going to have to deal with here over the next few weeks and see how it works um, it'll be interesting it'll be very interesting any questions yes ma'am I have two questions one is what if you're in the middle of a transaction like I wrote a contract on a guard form in December but if I have to write an amendment what do I do Effective today, if you don't have access, you, sh you won't be able to use it. Okay. Because the, the GAR rule is, is that when the new changes are implemented, you have it's 30 days to use those new changes. And now that's why they did it on the 24th, uh, because they implemented the new changes to the form for this year. Last year, around December 9th is when they did it. So technically, as far as I know, you won't have access to it. I haven't checked any sites today. I haven't gone out there today. but. As I know as to what they said that they were going to do, the switch was flipped at 12.01. But it's okay for it that everything's still on the guard form, the original contract and so forth, but if I have to write an amendment, I have yes. to do something else. Okay, if I don't want to spend $199, do I just write it on this legal pad? What do I do? Well, under the state law, a contract is whatever the two parties agree to. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a guard form. It doesn't necessarily have to be an MLS form. You can write it on a piece of paper and the two parties sign it. And it's... It's binding. However, the forms in some cases are written in order to protect the parties uh, that are involved in it. So it would be up to you would have to discuss it with your broker to see exactly which direction that they would want you to go in in order well, to facilitate. I would, and I would start with the free forms and yeah. then if you don't, 
you can come to me and I'm searching myself for other alternatives as well that I can, so that we're prepared and agents are protected. But and also FMLS and MLS have released what, 24 forms? Is I it? believe it's about 24 About 24 forms. forms that are available. Your listing agreements, purchase and sale, your buyer broker's agreements, and FHA, VA exhibits, and there were some other ones that were uh, leasing, basic amendments, leasing forms, things of that nature. Yes, her and I come to you. Question, is this national? No, this is just, just Georgia? Georgia, yes. Just Georgia? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. So you mentioned that FMLS and MLS forms. Where are these forms out? They're on their websites. On your website? Yes. Same, okay. Same transaction desk, you'll be able to access. Yes. You can use the FMLS and, v and MLS forms by virtue of your membership as a FMLS or MLS member. And as I understand it, both form, the forms are identical on both systems. Right. Yes. So they're out there. Yes, they, they should be out there today. And they were developed by a local attorney. So they're, you know, somebody who knows the Georgia market. Developer. Yeah, Morris, Hartwick, and Snyder, Morris, I think, is who, Snyder, who were the developers of those. I pulled this okay. up yesterday. Here's the forms that the are guide, available or the, yeah. on FMLS. Purchase and sale agreements mm -hmm. uh, with uh, both inspection and financing contingency language. Listing agreement, buyer brokerage agreement, commission acknowledgement for the closing attorney, lead-based paint form, counteroffer form, contract amendment form. They, they, their forms are different, okay, and we're gearing up to get ready for those forms, so please call the office, ask Ed or myself questions if you have one about the contract, okay? We're happy to walk you through it. We want to help you. We're there. We're learning them too, so, you know, but you know how we do things. We'll all put our heads together. If we all agree, then we feel like, okay, we've made a smart decision. So, um, because that's what I, if we're all standing here and we agree, then, you know, if somebody comes at us and challenges, all we can say is we discussed it and we felt like this was the right way to go. Bernie, can you address that they are going to continue to develop more forms? Yeah, that's gonna it's an ongoing process. They really got kind of caught off guard because this con convention mm -hmm. where they did do the, um, the vote was in September. Mm -hmm. So it was a very limited time and we actually as the independent brokers went to FMLS and sat down with them and so they really didn't even kick this off until October, early November before they started actually developing them. And so it's a very short period of time but the goal is to continue developing forms. So and also one of the, the authors of the new forms uh, for FMLS and MLS is and he's been a part of it is is how how sets on the forms committee for gar but how is very very knowledgeable about some of the the, the forms uh, all of the forms actually and he does a very very good job with it now you know how has how's had has a different way of presenting that all together uh, but but understand that he has been very instrumental and very vocal about his thoughts and feeling about the change as well. And, you know, and, and sometimes that can put you in a different light or a different position. But, but understand that it has not been something that has gone over well with a lot of people who have been involved with the, uh, the state association. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so if I'm hearing you correctly, an, excuse me, an agent that, that's a realtor makes an offer on my listing yay mm -hmm. so they put it on the the, the, the form mm -hmm. but now if my seller wants to counter back i'll just use that generic form in no. fmls and counter back no you can however he or she will probably give you authorization to use the form they will send you a link that's what happens an agent who's a realtor member can send you a link in order to utilize the gar forms but you don't have to. But you don't have you don't you don't have to in the sense of presenting an offer. If it's their listing and they say, well, we want to use it on the GAR form. Her example was they brought it her to her. Right, they brought it to her. So no, you can you can do it on the other form, but they can probably they probably say, well, hey, listen, let's put everything on this document to keep it all uniform. Let me let me back up to about something, and we talked about this as well regarding requirements. You know. Banks have their forms that they want you to use. Now you're going to have the GAR uh, forms that realtor members are going to want you to use. And then there's going to be forms that non-realtor members will have that they're going to want you to use. 
And it says, well, it's required. Well, let me tell you about requirements. Requirements can get you in some troubles by saying something is, quote, unquote, required. Now, what you want to do is that you want to try to find a way where the two of you all can utilize a document that can be interchanged between the parties to ensure that you facilitate the transaction with your client. For instance, I'm a realtor member. You send me an offer on a non-GAR form. Do I tell you, well, I'm not going to present this to my client because it's not on a GAR form? No, you better not. Thank you. You better not. You need to take that document and present it. And moving forward, you can determine which forms that you all are going to, quote unquote, use as a part of the transaction. Now, for me, if you send it to me on the form that is um, under the FMLS forms or the MLS forms, fine. I have access to those as well. We'll proceed using those documents. And understand that if it's a bank-owned property, the bank's going to send an amendment anyway that's go or addendum that's going to f practically counter everything that's in any form that we ever thought we could create in order to meet their requirements. <laughs> it's going to cut it all up. So be very, don't be um, intimidated by that specific saying that, well, I don't have your form, I can't make an offer. No. You have access to a document that has been written by, by an attorney. You as a licensee has a right to complete a preprinted form that has been prepared by an attorney. Fill it in, submit it. Yes, ma'am. How does the Real Estate Commission, uh, how are they working this out under their venue with the real estate? Well, they investor? really haven't taken a position. Their, their, their whole logic is to ensure that there are documents that are there to facilitate the need of a buyer, seller, tenant, or landlord. They haven't taken a position. Now, we'll tell you this. Charles Clark, the previous real estate commissioner, sits on the forms committee for GAR. So we're going back to Cowboy and Indian days. <laughs> that's what we're going back to. I can see it happening again. And that's unfortunate because I think that the, the form had allowed a very uniform marketplace. Thank you. It was very uniform. Everybody used it. It was very simple. Um, again, my thought behind that is, is that, you know, you beat me at marbles. Now I'm going to kick over your pile and pick up mines and go home. That's my my thought behind it. Yes, ma'am. Accessible, accessible through the website. Yes. The which forms? The GAR forms or the uh, MLS forms. Uh, non-realtor non forms. Yes, MLS and FMLS systems have access to them. You should be able to go to the transaction desk and be able to access those forms. I thought you just said that you couldn't. That's the no. non-GAR the non non the, the non forms. No, if you are a, a GAR member, you can still access the GAR forms through transaction desk. You just have to put in your NERS number. But if you're a non-GAR member, you can still act, you have to be able to access the MLS and FMLS forms through their website as well. You can still go to the same place and get either form, either document. If you're a member of the, of the team and the, the like Marshall the member of the board, can you just put his number in there? Could you hear the question? Yes. Yes. No. Yes. No. What's the question? Not unless that person, if you're working for that person and they're signing the document, yes. But if you're signing the document, no. It has to have your name on it. You have to be the licensed user. No, it won't have both names on it. Understand that the forms are going to be licensed to one individual. That person whose name appears on the bottom. So if you're on a team, everybody on that team, in order to use that form, had better have a license. Well, whatever, you need a nerd number or either a license. You can get a license by getting it through a software vendor, oh, you by purchasing it. you say license, you're talking about. Right, authorization to use it, the authorization to use it. Now, I have a, a licensed assistant who does forms on my behalf. It's fine. That licensed assistant should not sign that document because your name is on there. They can't sign, um, she can't put um, Gail Hamilton, uh, for Judge Parker. 
No, she can't do that. It has to be my signature. So if you're on teams and you have a team leader, that team leader's name is going to be on that form and he or she's name is who's going to have to sign that document. And so the other realtor, the other person, not realtor, the other agent should be on there all? It won't be. Because remember, it's individually. Each, each, each individual is licensed to use those documents. Everybody has to have a license. Where in the past, uh, when they first came out with them, when we had Realty One software, the companies were licensed. The brokerage was licensed to use it, and then you can have up to 10 agents or something, and you bought it based upon the number of agents. But now they've changed that all together. Each individual has to have the authorization to utilize that form. Those companies that you pay $200 for, mm -hmm. are they connected with the national No. They just simply have the licensing agreement between GAR and them to reproduce their forms in order to sell to so to other members. They yeah. Right. Well there's a fee for it, yeah. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Yes. I get her and I'll come back to you. Yes ma'am. Question. On the contracts and attachments and what have you. Mm -hmm. Um, you go through the company, they in turn you pay the fee of a one ninety nine to use their contracts here. Right. Uh, first question, how do you get to those? You go through their system? You go through the GAR system, there is I gave you that about the uh, web address. Okay. Yeah. Go to their system and you click the drop down box will show you all of the software vendors that are available. Okay. You click on the software vendor link. And it'll take you to how you pay for it. You can pay for it online. Okay. And in those contracts, the only thing they're doing is taking realtor out of it or anything that refers to a GAR at all. No, the correct? word realtor is still going to be there. On uh, the bottom of On the bottom contract. of it. But you don't have to put any information down there. That's not, that's not fair. Well, that's who owns it. <laughs> then why are we using, I don't want their contracts anymore. Can I use somebody else's? Yeah, you can use you have freedom to use whomever you like. I don't have I don't want them on my contract. They don't want I don't want to be part of God. You can use the free contract. Yeah, you can use the free one. Okay. But these are but these like I said, if you purchase the GAR forms, it's going to have realtor on it because it's a realtor organization who produced them. They've covered it all. Whether you can write real estate or not. Yes, yes. Let me um, let me answer that question real quick, but I want to get this young lady's question first, and then I'll come back. Well, you can answer that. Mine has to do with the history of it. So more okay. Curious. Now, the new, the free forms, to my understanding, I haven't read all of them, but I didn't re didn't see anything pertaining to arbitration. I didn't see it. See, that's the problem with if you submit one of those forms, I can see a lot of realtors not liking that there's not arbitration. They're not going to want to use it. Well, Yes and no, but do you know that you can arbitrate by virtue of the relationship you have with FMLS and MLS? Even though that they are a non-GAR member, you are under the FMLS. If you read the membership agreement, it states that you will arbitrate any monetary disputes under the NAR Arbitration and Ethics Guideline Manual. You present your case to them, to MLS and MLS. They present it to, uh, well, GAR now handles it for them for now. I don't know if they will continue, but you will have an opportunity to arbitrate those uh, those monetary disputes. Now, the new GAR forms have an arbitration paragraph in it. I think it's paragraph 13 or 14, but it dealing with arbitration specifically as to how it will proceed and, and what the expectations are behind it. Push the MLS and FMLS in the middle. Yes, sir. Um, what I see happening when, when we first had buyer brokers, we had some specialty buyer broker contracts that were out there. They were legal to use, like you say, group of the two parties, and they had you know leave all appliances in fine print and two-year warranties and a bunch of stuff. So you know you got one of those things, you had to read it. So we're, we're going to get some contracts, you know, their other vendors to say, hey, there's a market here. There's thousands of realtors. You know, we can do this for $100 or whatever. 
they're going to put a map there, so it's going to be the term Cowboys and Indians. Uh, yeah. I'm afraid that's what's going to happen. Yeah. That's right. uh, I'm just going to make your business a lot harder for all of us. As, as a listing agent, you're trying to protect your seller. you got to read those forms. you got to understand them word right. for word if you get something like that. So right. It's going to make it more difficult for us to listen. Yeah, and, and dealing with that, too, is that you got to have to be mindful of what the lenders may tell you next, too. By having all of the refrigerator appliances and all that stuff specified in an agreement, a lender may say, no, we don't want to see all of that because you're paying more for these items than your other house. <laughs> so, you, you know, you, you got to create all kinds of issues. Again, I, I just did not agree with the the decision to make that change. So don't shoot um, the messenger. Right, right. <laughs> well, I, I didn't agree. But however, I mean, it is what it is. Yeah, we're going to have to, yeah. we're going to have to um, improvise and, and, and do do better behind it. You know, I, I, I tell my, my folks all the time, change is inevitable, growth is, growth is optional. So change is going to come, but it's up to you to grow from it and become better behind it. So that's what we're going to have to do at this point. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. You don't need to change your forms. You got a binding contract. You don't need to change. If you're in the middle of negotiating one, you might have an issue. I haven't seen those forms in detail uh, to say whether or not they're similar or not. Uh, but they they are some some as I understand it some very adequately written forms, um, you know that you can utilize. Let me just share a few things with you for those of you who decide to go and use the GAR forms this year. That there have been a number of changes to the GAR forms um, and, and some additions to new forms this year. They have a new form is the F15. It's called Agreement to Work with the Buyer as a Customer. It's different than the Customer Acknowledgement form. It gets a little bit more specific. Uh, spelling out what your requirements are from a customer relationship. Although we know we are to perform ministerial acts, however, it goes specifically into what those ministerial acts are and how they shall be performed by the party, the brokerage that's involved with it. Uh, numbers, the F-16, this is a new form. It says protect yourself when selling a home. There is a uh, form now for the sellers. You know, buyers had one, protect yourself when buying a home. Uh, well, let me back up. It says protect yourself when selling a house. And a buyer's, it says protect yourself when buying a home. So, but it, it's a form there, and this is to protect you to ensure that you tell them the things that they should do when they're selling your home. They can say, well, you never told me that. Well, if I give you this form, I did tell you. Uh, the next one is leasing. Yes, ma'am. No, it's gearing towards the buyer or the seller. Right, and yeah. You, and then if, if you don't, if you give it to a person and you're not a realtor, no. then it's right away, it's you, like working against yourself. No, but the form also go, all of the documents also have a specific space down on the bottom that, that allows you at the signature page to identify yourself as a realtor member and what association you're affiliated with. And if you leave it blank, then you're saying that you're not a realtor member. Now, the form was quote, designed by realtors for the use of realtors. However, by using it does not implicate that you are a realtor. You just have the licensing requirement to use it. Now, realtor is in the documents, but it's not so prevalent that it takes away from the use of it on, on non-realtor uh, behalf. So it's, it's going to be there. Uh, another form is one that we've been wanting for a long time is leasing commission confirmation. Most people were using the the um, the instruct closing instructions to attorney. What I can't remember what it's called, um, but anyway, authorization by the attorneys with closing instructions as a commission for leases. It wasn't the right form for that, or they were writing it on an amendment and were addressed that issue in order to have a form that was more conducive for leasing because leasing is a huge, huge, huge part of our marketplace nowadays. That form is F-37. 
Then there's another new form. It's the F-78, the USDA form. It's, a, it's an exhibit. It is another one of those super exhibits, uh, like the FHA and VA forms, which are super exhibits, because there's a lot of areas in, in the metro area that is still considered rural uh, by virtue of the zip code that falls under that USDA requirement. So that was another form that come about. Uh, the F-109, which is Amendment to Change the Due Diligence Period. There was never a form that addressed that issue if you needed to change the due diligence period. Uh, if your buyer or seller needed additional, or if your buyer needed additional time in order to continue an inspection, you would have to do an amendment to the agreement to change the due diligence period. But now there's a form to specifically spell out when the due diligence is going to expire and when all part both parties agree the due diligence period shall expire on this day versus the date that was originally scheduled. Then there's another one is the F-110, it's the amendment to the lease agreement, which was something that we needed to do as well because we were amending leases on an amendment to the agreement versus having a form specific for that purpose. And it continues to spell out um, all the terms that were originally mentioned in the lease shall continue to be enforced unless they are uh, different than what is going to be placed in the stipulation section. And then there's the F-114, notice to reject um, offer slash counter offer. You can just simply use this form if there's an offer that comes through that you just want to reject, period. And it's done. And then you have a form that the Real Estate Commission actually encouraged this year. They typically don't get involved in that, but they did encourage it. And it's called, it's for brokers and it's for company operation. It's the company form CO5 broker transaction checklist and contract review. The brokers are required by law, by its Georgia rule, to review contracts within 30 days of being placed with your organization. So this form allowed you the opportunity to verify to the commission if they ever did an inspection of your office that you actually physically touched this file, you saw it because you initialed it or you checked it off and you signed it stating that you, the broker who's responsible, has now seen this, this, this uh, contract and you're understanding the uh, parameters that the contract may offer. So those are some of the changes. There's some other forms that were changed up. The counteroffer form F-22 was also changed this year. It's a little bit more solid. It took out the amendment uh, or the counteroffer number in it. And there's a number of reasons why that took place. Uh, and then there are some changes to the um, conventional form, financing form. There were some changes to the FHA form, the VA form, and the purchase and sale agreement, of course, had some changes as well. But those are what you have with the GAR forms. Now, again, I did not like the decision, but do understand that the GAR forms it, have been some forms that have been evolving over the years that are some of the most comprehensive forms that you can use in the marketplace to help you facilitate transactions with your with your buyers, sellers, tenants, and landlords, and they are derived from legal challenges. Everything that's in those forms in most cases that change are derived from legal challenges. Let me give you one example, then I'll pass the mic off. Paragraph uh, 17, the default paragraph. Everybody knows about that paragraph, right? dealing with if a buyer or seller defaults in a transaction that either party could be subjected or be liable to the other parties. In essence, it states that if the buyer defaults, the buyer is could be uh, liable to pay the commission for the listing broker as well as for the selling broker. If the seller defaults, the seller could still have the same requirement. In the past, we didn't have that. And what came about from that was Reynolds versus, I can't think of the name, or in Jackson, Pargar versus Jackson was another one that, that also helped facilitate that. Reynolds versus something, Bleakman, I think is who it was. But anyway, and the long and short of it was is that an agent wrote an agreement, in Pargar versus Jackson, the agent wrote an agreement and had a buyer brokerage agreement and did not put anything in the section for commission from the buyer because it specifically say we seek to get our commissions from the sellers. However, in the event that the seller does not pay, then we will get X amount of dollars from our buyer client. Agent put a zero there, went to court. The court said, yeah, you're right. And then also it specifically stated that when we terminated the agreement between the parties, we also terminated our commission rights. So therefore it birthed a new form called a mutual settlement form. So the mutual settlement, which is the F87, I think is the number on that one, allows you to terminate the agreement between the parties, but preserve your commission rights. 
and then it allows you the ability to sue either party that defaulted in the agreement. But, of course, you can get with your broker and get with an attorney, and they will determine as to how the lawsuit should proceed or if there's one actually available to you. Any other questions? Well, thank you. Yes, ma'am. No, if you're a life member, it's only pertaining to um, million, dollar million Dollar Club. Yes. That's the only life membership you get. Any other questions? Concerns, suggestions, apprehensions? Yes, ma'am. So the non-realtor forms are not guaranteed, as you're saying, Based on what you're saying, this is my comprehension that it might not be like the golf forms that they had challenges. And right. I'm saying the golf forms have been challenged and tried in court and made the adjustments or necessary adjustments in order to further protect uh, your interests as well as the parties that you serve. The new forms have not had that challenge yet. They haven't. Not to say that they will, but they haven't. But the point is, is that you do have a document that is available to you if you choose to pay for access to it that have been challenged and are constantly being updated um, every single year. And, and I know people say, I'm so tired of these daggum changes to the form, but trust me, a lot of them are necessary. A lot of them really, really are necessary. There was a point in time where a, an appellate court judge said that our forms had an embedded command in it that required us to perform a task that we weren't doing. It's like, okay, how did you come up with that? Told us what it was. It was in the in the purchase and sale agreement. And the purchase and sale agreement in 2007, I think, is when I had a kind of a major overhaul. Mm -hmm. That's what that was about. Yes, ma'am. Uh, FYI, earlier someone asked this question about if you've got a contract or something in the mail. Um, Non-realtors who opt not to pay the license fee will retain read-only access to their previously created contracts, mm -hmm. i.e. view, print only, no edits, and no addition. Yes, it will be on the transaction desk. Yes, that's correct. Okay, so if we have something in process that's ending right mm -hmm. now, we're going to need to do, let's say we need to do the seven-day extension. I'm not going to close it. Right, or the, we, it, they didn't get loan approval or whatever. Uh, we will not be able to sell you a guard form. No, if you're not a guard member, if you don't have a member, member number. If the other agent is, he can, yeah, she can give it to you. Yes. To. And that most of them will. Most of them will. Yeah, they will. Yes, ma'am. No, no. All those things are still enforceable. The question was, if you have a listing agreement that's on the guard form, do you need to change it? No. That document is enforceable. It, it is still something that you operate off of until it expires. And then once it expires, then you can change to another document that will be enforced or enforceable for the use of your, your client. Yes, ma'am. Are they going to take my car? Wait away since I'm not a realtor anymore. <laughs> well, probably not. You paying for the tag? You pay for the tag. It probably won't take it. No. <laughs> well, thank you guys. You've been a great crowd. I appreciate it. Okay, I, I did want to make mention, if you guys have ever been on the Drake database, which is where we store all of your contracts, everything you turn into the office, there's a little tab up there called Broker's Corner. Ed and I are going to start posting stuff on that, under that section, throughout all these contracts. We're going to go through it. Ed's actually volunteered to, to yeah, I heard you last week. He's going to fill out one of the new contracts, fill out a GAR contract, and put the notes in there. And then, as he's always done, his door is always open for you to come in and go through a contract with him. But he's going to have these contracts posted up there so that you can actually pull that up, 
read through it as you're filling out your contract or before you want to come sit down with Ed and then you have something to kind of look at. He's going to have all these notes and if ever you've sat down with one of, Ed, one of Ed's little sessions, you know what you're doing by the time you leave. So just give us a little bit of time to get, to get this stuff up because we're, these forms are new to everybody. But that's where we post it. It's called Broker's Corner. It's on our intranet. And anybody who doesn't know how to access it, just call the office and because everybody gets access. And all of your contracts are there and they, anything you turn into the office. So it's also a good place to check if you can't remember if you've turned something in. To double check, you can just log on. It's internet based. You can do it at any time, anywhere you get internet. So just keep an eye out for that and you'll start seeing some stuff in that little section regarding these contracts. Because we'll, And we're going to do it quick. We know we've got to get it up there because it's an immediate need. It's just we all are seeing these contracts for the first time now. So, But I mean what I've seen, it's, it's I think we'll all do fine, but call. We are op we're around, just call us directly if you have a question. We'll be happy to help you. Does MHS wrote them? Uh, is there somebody there that, that we could call them? MHS is not, um, it's, there's not, it, they're not opening it up right now. Okay. So um, I think if we had a question, we could probably um, find somebody at MHS that would help us through it. But that that's not right. out there right now. Because if you notice when FMLS and Georgia MLS announced everything as far as, they did not put Morris Harvest Snyder's name on any of those e any of those announcements they just said an Atlanta attorney so they you know and I think there's a couple of reasons around that but just you know we know because we were part of the conversation we were part of that original group that did approach them what percentage do you know of, or do you know this of Metro Atlanta agents are DAR members do you know what percentage or not 42 42 percent are members are members so yeah, 42, well, I'll tell you this, 42 percent of the individuals that are in the uh, the MLS systems are GAR members. Okay. That's interesting. We don't know how many of the, of the others are part-timers or anything. No, we don't know. But that's Georgia-wide, correct? No, that's yes. Oh, that's, that's Georgia-wide. Georgia okay, not just Metro. That's not Metro Atlanta. Metro Atlanta numbers are probably a little higher than the statewide numbers. I would say if I had to guess, Metro Atlanta numbers was probably somewhere around maybe half. So again, I mean, if you're in the middle of a transaction and A, they cannot tell you that because their broker requires guard, that you have to use the guard. They can't say that, but what they can, they can ask, if, would you mind? But anybody can use either form. As you either pay for the guard access or you can use the free forms. It's just, it, it's your choice if they put it on the listing, they can't, they still can't demand it as a guard form. So, but, and, that other agent can but that other agent can open it up and say, I'll grant you access for this transaction. So, they will do that. They will grant you access for that specific transaction that you're involved in. Sure, Debbie. So what you're saying, if I'm in the middle of a transaction, like I'm supposed to present this um, purchase and sales for a uh-huh. And uh, I've got all my forms ready to go, didn't print them out. So I have to, if I go in and pay $199, I can't use those forms. I better redo all those forms on the new 2012 card forms? Uh, it's 30 days. You can use it. It's but 30 days. However, if you go, and see, that's something else that they haven't really cleared up as to how that's going to work. If you're going to still have access on the transaction desk, or so if you're going to have to go to the software vendor site in order to utilize it. To my understanding, you are going to have to now go, to, if you pay the 199 go to the software vendor site in order to access it, unless they're going to give you a new, give you a number to access it on the transaction desk. And that, had, that wasn't very clear as to how that was going to transition because MLS and FMLS were still trying to work it out with GAR as to how that was going to merge, and also with transaction desk as to how they were going to set up their system to identify everybody who had an urge number versus not having one. So all of that was something that was in. I would call. I mean, it's not. Before I would call FMLS if you log on and you look and you don't have access to them. I would call them because they have said that you have 30 days to use the 2011 is what they said. But whether or not they weren't sure, nobody's been positive 
because nobody controls the whole bucket. As of my understanding, as of today. Yeah, well, that's what you call them if that happens. I mean, that's all I can tell you because it, nobody really controlled the whole bucket at this point. That's the problem. Now more other people control different parts. So in the past, if it was, you know, FMLS had the license to, to distribute the GAR, they could do whatever they wanted internally as far as that distribution because they had the right to do that. They don't have the right to do that. It's, I mean, you know what I'm saying? Because now you have to have that, the access. But you're going to have to, I would call them. If you get into that position where you log on and you don't have access to those forms, I would call them and just say, okay, this is a situation, I need my forms because I prepared them and I'm ready to go present it. So, but I, I mean, until you log on, nobody really knows. So, any other questions? Remember, check our intranet under Broker's Corner and you'll see tips and all kinds of information about the contracts and you can always call us because we will make sure we get back to you because we understand it's frustrating when you're not confident in your contract.